Hello everybody, so thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be looking at the high yield rheumatology and orthopaedic images that crop up in medical school final exams. So the Medicine Guide is a YouTube channel which offers free videos to help support medical students all throughout their journey at medical school. So I've got videos on how to be successful in the preclinical and clinical years. I've got a paediatrics edition focusing on the high yield paediatric topics that crop up in medical school final exams. I've got an obs and gynae edition focusing on the high yield obs and gynae topics that crop up in medical school exams. I've got a cardiology edition focusing on the high yield topics. And this video is part of my high yield finals quiz. So other videos include looking at the classic abdominal x-rays that crop up in final exams. Also the classical CT head imaging that crops up in final exams, high yield chest x-rays, also high yield nerve palsies, and today's video is looking at rheumatology and orthopaedic imaging. So if you enjoy my videos, then please can I ask you to kindly give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and share my video with your friends. So without further ado, let's get started. So today's video will be more of a quiz. So I've got 10 questions with high yield rheumatology and orthopedic imaging that crops up in final exams. So this might take the form of a hand x-ray or an e-x-ray or perhaps an x-ray of the lumbar spine. And there will be key points of pathology that hopefully you'll be able to draw upon and you'll be able to identify as attributing to a certain disease. So if you've got your pen and paper at the ready, then we'll begin. So I'll give you 10 seconds to come up with a diagnosis of this condition, or you can pause the screen, it's entirely up to you. Okay, let's find out the answer. Okay, so this first image is representing a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis. So I appreciate the screen does look busy, but if we look first at the mnemonic and then work our way through the image. So I use the mnemonic of LESS to help identify patients who have rheumatoid arthritis. So they'll present typically with a loss of joint space, periarticular or juxtarticular erosions, soft tissue swelling, and finally soft bones or osteopenia. So if we look at the first label point on the top of the screen and then work our way around in a clockwise fashion. So we'll begin firstly with ulnar deviation of the digits. So you can see that the digits appear quite crooked and they appear deviated towards the ulnar side. So that helps to describe ulnar deviation of the digits. Secondly, we can see that there's a loss of the joint space and the best example of seeing loss of the joint space is actually looking at the third digit and looking at that particular joint. And now the next point that we're going to look at is subluxation of the thumb. So it looks as though there's some sort of deviation of the thumb that the, that the thumb's almost been pushed over and that image is represented by the description of subluxation of the thumb. Now, moving along in a clockwise fashion, we can see evidence of periarticular or juxtaarticular erosions, particularly along the third metacarpal bone. And finally, we can see that there's rheumatoid arthritis affecting both the metacarpal phalangeal joints and the PIPs. And rheumatoid arthritis classically affects the metacarpal phalangeal joints, the MCPs, and the proximal interphalangeal joints, the PIPs, across both hands. So please remember that there's a symmetrical presentation in patients who have rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so let's look at the next image. So I'll give you 10 seconds for this. Okay, so this is an example of osteoarthritis and the mnemonic that I use for osteoarthritis is LOSS. 
So there's a loss of the joint space, there's the presence of osteophytes, there's the presence of subchondral sclerosis and also subchondral cysts. So if we begin at the top and work our way around in a clockwise fashion, so the first thing that I want to bring to your attention is the presence of subchondral sclerosis. So you can see the thickening and the, the fact that there's areas of greater whiter intensity when you're looking on the knee x-ray and that intensity is what's known as subchondral sclerosis. Then we've got the presence of osteophytes. So we've got this irregular bony outgrowth. So that's the osteophyte. And after that, we've got loss of the joint space. So we can see that the joint space on the medial aspect of the knee is far narrower than the joint space on the far lateral aspect of the knee. OK. And then finally, we can see the presence of subchondral cysts and they appear more of a dark black area on a knee x-ray. And those are the key features of osteoarthritis that you need to keep in mind for your exams. OK. So if you'd like to have a go at this one, I'll now give you 10 seconds for this. So this is an example of a collis fracture. So a collis fracture is when you fracture the distal third of the radius. And the best way that I use to remember that is if you imagine a collis fracture to be similar to collid. So in a collis fracture, you've collid the third, the sorry, the distal third of the radius. So that's a mnemonic that I use for collis fracture. So you've collid the distal third of the radius. Now, another useful way of remembering what a collis fracture looks like on, a, on an x-ray is that the collis fracture is similar to what's known as the dinner fork deformity. So on a lateral view, the hand will appear similar to a dinner fork. OK, so let's move on to the fourth x-ray image. So I'll give you 10 seconds for this. So this is an example of Paget's disease of the bone, and because we're looking at the skull, particularly, we can think of this as Paget's disease of the skull. So as a medical student, there aren't many skull x-rays that you need to be familiar with, but one of the skull x-rays that you do need to be familiar with is Paget's disease of the skull or Paget's disease of the bone. So these patients will present classically with a thickened calvarium, and they'll also present with cotton wool spots. But I would say the classic finding and the most easiest identifiable feature on a skull x-ray is the thickened calvarium. So please keep your eyes peeled out for that if you do have an exam question with a skull x-ray. OK, so let's look at the next image. So I'll give you 10 seconds to find out the diagnosis of this or you can pause the video. OK, let's have a look at the answer. So this is an example of pseudogout. So pseudogout on an image will be represented by this area of chondrocalcinosis. So this chondrocalcinosis is this white hueish line that you can see along the joint line. So this is representing calcification of the hyaline cartilage. OK. So let's look at question number six. So again, you've got 10 seconds. OK, so let's look at the image. So this is an example of a multiple myeloma and a multiple myeloma presents on a skull X-ray with a raindrop pattern. So you can see um, little circular blobs around the skull. It looks a little bit like a raindrop pattern and that should hopefully trigger the light bulbs in your mind to think that this is a multiple myeloma. OK, so that's a key classical finding. And let's have a look at number seven. 
again, I'll give you 10 seconds. Or you can pause the screen, it's entirely up to you. Okay, let's look at the answer. So this is an example of a Smith's fracture and patients who suffer from a Smith's fracture are at risk of developing a median nerve palsy. And if you want to find out more about median nerve palsies, then please do watch my high yield quiz focusing on nerve palsies. So let's have a look at question number eight. Okay, let's have a look at the answer. So this is a patient presenting with psoriatic arthritis. Psoriatic arthritis classically presents on an x-ray with a pencil and cup sign. So if you have a look at the hand x-ray in the question and then have a look on the far right hand side, hopefully you can appreciate this pencil and cup sign. And this is a very high yield image that does crop up quite often in medical school final exams. Okay, so let's look at the next image. So I'll give you 10 seconds to consider the diagnosis or you can pause the video, it's entirely up to you. Okay, let's look at the answer. So this is really demonstrating all the different types of images that could crop up and ankylosing spondylitis. So if we start on the far left hand side of the screen and then work our way down. So the image that was found in the previous question was that of a bamboo spine. So a bamboo spine is representing the fusion of the vertebral joints and that's a very classic feature of ankylosing spondylitis. Other features that are suggestive of ankylosing spondylitis involves the dagger sign. So the dagger sign is when there's ossification of the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments. Another key feature is that patients are at risk of developing sacroiliitis. So if you have a look at the x-ray image, hopefully you'll begin to appreciate that there's areas of subchondral sclerosis, so that's areas of bone thickening, and also areas of subchondral erosions. And also, patients can present with syndesmophytes. So syndesmophytes are where there is ossification of the outer fibres of the annulus fibrosis. And finally, patients who suffer from ankylosing spondylitis are at risk of developing squaring of the vertebral bodies. And I've try to draw a square around one of the vertebral, vertebral bodies to help you compare how similar the green square is in terms of the preceding vertebral bodies and hopefully you'll begin to appreciate that there is some degree of squaring occurring and these are all the potential images that they could throw in the exam paper and all of these images on this screen are suggestive of a patient with ankylosing spondylitis. So please make sure that you're familiar with all of these different features, okay? So let's have a look at question number 10, our final question of the quiz. Okay, so I'll give you 10 seconds to come up with a diagnosis of this condition or you can pause the video. Okay, so let's find out the answer. So this is an example of a scaphoid fracture and a scaphoid fracture is high yield for both rheumatology and orthopedics. So patients will commonly present with pain over the anatomical snuff box and a scaphoid fracture if missed is something that's incredibly concerning because these patients are at risk of developing avascular necrosis. So a patient with a suspicion of a scaphoid fracture needs to have an x-ray. After the x-ray they need to have a splint and an x-ray should be repeated two weeks later in fracture clinic. Now even on the x-ray if the scaphoid fracture isn't entirely identified, 
So the scaphoid fracture itself isn't particularly obvious. However, they do have clinical signs of a scaphoid fracture. It's important that we splint these patients and offer a, a repeated x-ray in two weeks later because the risk of missing a scaphoid fracture is something that's quite disastrous for both the patient and for us as healthcare professionals because a vascular necrosis is a major concern in scaphoid fractures. Okay. So thank you for watching my video today. I hope you've enjoyed my quiz. If you've enjoyed my video, please can I ask you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please could you give me a thumbs up? Please could you share my video with your friends? And I'd just like to wish you all the best with your exams. And thank you very much for watching my video today.